We've had a great opportunity uh, to come together and worship. And one of those, uh, uh, one of the activities we engaged in was uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper. And for those uh, of you who are like me, we've uh, we've been partaking of the Lord's Supper for a number of years. And while that is great, there's also a danger in that. And by that, I simply mean sometimes if we don't back off and, and look at things kind of fresh and new, we may sometimes uh, forget why, uh, why we're doing these things and, and what effect it's supposed to have on us. So this morning, I want us to look at the Lord's Supper, and we're going to look at some questions about the Lord's Supper, and hopefully these will remind us about what it is and why we're doing it. Some of those questions... Why do we call it the Lord's Supper? And are there any other names for it besides the Lord's Supper? What is the meaning of it when we call it the Lord's Supper? What does it mean and what does it mean for us and to us when we partake of it? Is the Lord's Supper for, for everyone in the world or is it only for some? And then why do we partake of it every first day of the week and why do we not partake of it any other day of the week? And this lesson is primarily to, to help us understand and refocus so that we don't take things for granted. Also, when people ask us these questions, we'll be able to help them understand the importance of the Lord's Supper. So to our first question, why is it called the Lord's Supper? Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we begin this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll begin in verse 23. Remember, this is the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth had all kinds of, of issues and questions. Some of those dealt with the Lord's Supper. So, just like us today, we need to be reminded of these purposes and what we're doing and why we're doing it. And not to think about it as just something we do every Sunday. Because it's way more than that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, Paul says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. So this came from Christ to Paul, and Paul says, I have delivered it to you, I am delivering it to you again. See, people need to be reminded on a regular basis of these very important matters. What, what happened? That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Notice in two of those instances, what did he say? Do this in remembrance of me. So it is a memorial it's a feast. It's a remembrance to honor the Lord. Jesus says, do this in a memorial to me. So every first day of the week, as we have this morning, we are remembering and honoring what Jesus has done for us. Again, it's not just something we do every first day of the week when we gather. There's a reason behind it, and there's a very important purpose behind it. It is honoring the Lord. When Jesus instituted it back in Matthew chapter 26, remember the background. Him and the apostles are in Jerusalem during Passover. They're in the upper room, and a lot of things happen in that upper room. And certainly one thing that's important is the institution of the Lord's Supper. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 and following. And as they were eating, talking about the apostles, 
Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus himself instituted it. Now, Jesus didn't institute singing, did he? No, there was singing long before Christ came. Jesus didn't institute praying. There was praying long before Christ came. But this is something he specifically began. So this is a memorial. It's a remembrance. It's a feast that honors him. So that needs to be going on in our mind when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper. That it's a remembrance of what Christ has done. Are there any other names in the New Testament for it? Sometimes we call it what? The communion. Well, is that a scriptural term for it? Should we use that term? Well, if you're still in 1 Corinthians, let's go to chapter 10 this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> and we'll begin reading in verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16. Paul again writes, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? A communion. That term is sometimes translated fellowship. It's sometimes translated sharing. Sometimes it's translated participation. Or that's the idea behind it. So, when we were partaking of the Lord's Supper, we were doing it as the body. There was a very special communion taking place. That's why we use the term. So we who are in the one body were participating jointly. We were fellowshipping. I know sometimes we use the term fellowship when we're talking about having a fellowship meal uh, and, or sometimes being in the fellowship hall or whatever. But in a very, very specific way, this fellowship kind of outdoes all the others. The fellowship we have when we're partaking of this. That's why it's so critical when we're partaking of it that our minds are where they ought to be. It's so essential because what we're doing here on Sunday is unique. It's not done any other time of the week. We pray at other times, don't we? We sing at other times and we read the Bible at other times and so forth. But when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's very unique. So it's a very unique fellowship. It's a unique sharing. And that makes it something very special and something we can't just do every first day of the week. It's far too important. If you'll notice also in that verse 16, it is sometimes called, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a term used for the whole thing, it's breaking of the bread. Sometimes we use that term, don't we? and that's a biblical term. That's a biblical term. We saw it there in verse 16. But if we go back to Acts, the very beginning of the church, in Acts chapter 2, turn with me to verse 42. Now, we know what happens in Acts chapter 2, don't we? It's the beginning of the church, the founding of the church. Peter and those uh, apostles with him, they, they give that first full gospel sermon and a number of people respond to it and they were all added to that church, the assembly, the saved. And in Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> beginning in verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. What did they do? They began to break bread. The Lord's Supper wasn't being done before that, was it? 
See, Jesus instituted it. What did he say? He instituted it back on the night he was betrayed. But what did he say he wasn't going to do? I'm not going to drink this cup with you until I drink it new with you in the kingdom. Well, when did the kingdom start? Well, we just read Acts chapter 2. So from Acts chapter 2 and all the way to today, what happens? Jesus is with us when we partake. When was the last time you thought about that? That Jesus is with us when we partake of the Lord's Supper. When we commune, we're not just communing with each other, we're communing with Christ. And so from Acts chapter 2 on, He is with the church when they partake of that in a very special way. There's another term for it that's used in the New Testament. It's called the table of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll go down a few verses to verse 21. He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. He says, you can't do that. Well, why is it called the table of the Lord? Because it belongs to Him. It's His table. But what is meant by that? What's meant by the table of the Lord? What we call the Lord's Supper, what we call the communion, what we call breaking of the bread. So those belong to Him. Remember what He said in Matthew 26, Take, eat, this is my body. See, it belongs to Him. This is my blood. It belongs to Him. So the elements belong to Him. So that's why you and I don't have any right to change those elements because He said what they were. It belongs to Him. I don't have any right to change that. Neither do you, nor has anybody since the first century had any right to change it. So I can't change the, the fruit of the vine to anything else. It has to be the fruit of the vine. Why? Because it belongs to Him. It's not up for you or I to change it. Same way with the unleavened bread. It's not for you and I to change. It belongs to Him. He chose that. So He said, He's the one that instituted it. So He said, These are the ones I want you to use. Unfortunately, many today in the world believe they can change anything they want to on it. But they simply don't have the right because it's not their table. It's His. Just like it's His day. Today is the Lord's day. Just like it's the Lord's Supper and the Lord's table. So it's not up to you or I to change anything. He's the one that instituted it. So you and I cannot change it. There are some things that should not ever be called, though. It should never be called a sacrament, as some religious groups do. It's not a sacrament. The Bible never calls it that, and the way the world uses the term today, it should never be called a sacrament. Neither should it be called a Eucharist, as many in the religious world call it. That's not what it is. So we need to use Bible names for it, like the Lord's Supper, or a communion, or the breaking of bread, or the table of the Lord. Again, why? Because it's His. That's why. It's His. It's not ours. We remember Him when we partake of it. Which leads us to what all does it mean when we say it's a memorial? What does that cause us to do? It causes us to remember. You know, the world puts up memorials to all kinds of things, don't they? So we know what memorials are. So when we talk about a memorial, we know what it is. It's something that we do or look at or see that causes us to remember something specific, a person or an event. So this memorial that we uh, all together jointly partook of causes us to remember what Christ did. He said, do this in remembrance of me. It's right there in front of the table. 
do this in remembrance of me. What specifically are we to remember? Well, what did he say? He says, remember this body which was given for you. That's what we're focusing on is what Jesus did on the cross. He gave his life. He said, what about the fruit of the vine? This is the blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant which was set shed for many. Those are the things that need to be going on in our mind when we're partaking of it. That's why it's so imperative that everybody do all in their power to make the environment such so that we can really truly focus on what we're doing. It's everybody's responsibility. Everybody's. Because it's so important, as we'll see in just a moment, that we are focusing on what we're doing. That we're just not taking a bit of cracker and drinking some grape juice. I can do that at home. I drink, I drink grape juice at home. You may too, don't you? Do you do that? When you do that, are you partaking of the Lord's Supper? No. You may eat crackers at home. Is that partaking of the Lord's Supper? No. It is something special when we do it on the first day of the week in our worship. Then it becomes a memorial. We're remembering what Christ has done. Again, that's why it is so important. Those two elements are symbolic. He chose them specifically. The unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, they were chosen specifically. They were chosen by Christ Himself. Again, that's why we're not to change it. The unleavened bread, He said, take this bread. This is My body, which was given for you. The fruit of the vine. This is my blood that was shed for many for the remission of sin. This is my blood of the new covenant. So this reminds us that Jesus is with us. I think it would all, uh, it would help all of us to remember that Jesus said, I'm partaking of it with you in the kingdom. So every first day of the week, He's with us. Not in physical form, but He's with us. I know He's with us because He said He's going to be with us. He is with us when we partake of it. Again, that makes it so important. And that, again, it, it, it makes us think that we really have to focus with all of our power on what we're doing because it's so easy Just to take a piece of the cracker, pass the plate, take a drink of the juice and pass it. It's so easy to do that without putting our mind and our will into what we're doing. It becomes so easy just to do it. When we do it like that, it becomes a ritual, doesn't it? But it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be really the, the center of our week what we focus on, that. Because that's the single greatest event in the history of humanity. And that's what we're thinking about. So no wonder it deserves our greatest attention that we do that very thing. So Jesus is with us. In Revelation chapter 3, we have an interesting verse, I think, that applies. Revelation chapter 3. Notice verse 20. Revelation 3, verse 20. This would certainly apply to the Lord's Supper. This was written to the church of the Laodiceans who certainly had a, a lot of problems. He says in verse 20 of Revelation 3, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. That's what we just did in the Lord's Supper. He dined with us and us with Him. That's how significant and important the Lord's Supper is. 
And that's why it is, it is so necessary for us to do everything in our power to partake of it every week. It's a time of fellowship. It's a time of fellowship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we read verse 16 where we talked about it being a communion. Notice verse 17. Very next verse, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 17. And remember this is written to Christians. He says, For we though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. We all do. It's a time of fellowship. Something we do and maybe something we don't think about very often, but when we partake of it, we're all in one body and that body has one head. So when we partake of it as Jesus has instructed, we're in essence declaring that we're all united under His authority because He's the one that instituted it and He's the one that, that has told us uh, what its purpose is and how to do it and how often to do it. It shows that we're united when we do it as He has instructed us. So it is a time of fellowship. It's a time of showing that we're united. And it provides strength. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, notice verse 27 and following. I talked about this is the effect of the Lord's Supper. This is the effect of the Lord's Supper. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Notice verse 30. For this reason, for this specific reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. By not partaking of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, now it doesn't say we're worthy. None of us are really worthy to partake of it. He's not using that as an adjective to describe us. He's using it as an adverb to describe how we're partaking of it. So there's a way we can partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. There's a way we can partake of it in an unworthy manner. Some of, the, some of the Christians in Corinth were partaking of it in an unworthy manner and he said, what was the result? They were getting spiritually sick and spiritually weak. That happens, number one, when we don't partake of it and number two, when we partake of it in an unworthy manner. Well, how do I know if it's in an unworthy manner? Well, he tells us. He says... He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So you and I have to understand again and be focusing on what it is we're doing. And we have to understand its purpose and we have to understand what the elements mean and what we're doing collectively, that we're actually... Uh, eating and drinking with the Lord and with each other. Notice how that takes some willpower and determination and focus. That's why especially during this part of our worship period, all of us need to do all we can to be focusing on exactly what it is we're doing. Because if we don't, he says, you could become spiritually weak and spiritually sick. That's why it's so important. So who's to partake of it? Who has the right to partake of it? In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we're told who's to partake of it. In Acts chapter 20, let's notice verse 7. And we'll be going back to that in a moment. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Actually, let's start in verse 6. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. And him staying seven days has significance. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, who came together to break bread? The disciples. 
Who are the disciples? Well, we learn back in Acts chapter 11 that the disciples were called Christians. So who came together to break bread on the first day of the week? Christians. Those are the ones who have the right to partake of the Lord's Supper. Christians. Those in the body. Those who are part of Christ's church. Those have a right to partake of the Lord's Supper. That's who did back in Acts chapter 2, right? They that gladly received the word were baptized and about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continue doing what? One of the things was breaking the bread. Who? The church. The disciples. The Christians. Those in the body of Christ. Those were the ones who were partaking of the Lord's Supper. So it's a right and it's a blessing to be able to do that. Just like 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, as we read in our class with Jude, talks about how wonderful and marvelous a blessing it is to be called the children of God. So the Lord's Supper should never be thought of as something I have to do every Sunday. It's something that I'm allowed and blessed to do every Sunday. So the last question is, why do we only observe it on Sunday and why do we observe it every Sunday? Well, we just read in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, what did they do? What was their practice? Oh, on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. That was their practice. Why the first day of the week? Because that's the Lord's day. That's His day. Just like the Lord's Supper is His supper and the table of the Lord is His table. It's His. It belongs to Him. So that's what the church did in the first century. Paul waited, as we saw in verse 6, because he had missed it. So he waited for that week so he could partake of it with them on the first day of the week. And that's the reason he waited. was so he could meet with them on the first day of the week. So he waited that whole time. Now, Paul had a lot of things to do. If it didn't make any difference what day of the week uh, to partake of it on, he would have did it on Monday or Tuesday so he could do it and be gone. This, this was uh, one of his missionary trips. But he waited. Why? Because that was the day they were to partake of it on. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 and 2, where he talks about the collection of the saints? They were to do that what? Well, turn over a few pages. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. First Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. I wish we had a lot more time to talk about these two verses, but we don't. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. So this was something all the churches were to do, not just one. This was their practice. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Why the first day of the week? Because that's when they came together to break bread. Going back to Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And if you have an even more modern translation, you'll see the word every there. Now, on the first day of every week, the word every is there in the Greek. If you have an English standard version, which just came out two or three years ago, the word every is there. Now, on the first day of every week. So there's no doubt that's what they did every week. They came together to break bread. Who? The disciples, the Christians, the church. They did it every week. Also every week they did what? They gathered up that collection. That was to be used in that case for the poor saints in Jerusalem. They did it every week. For us to do it every week means... That you and I, when it's time to partake of the Lord's Supper, have a great responsibility. And that responsibility is to make sure we don't eat and drink in an unworthy manner. And that means we don't uh, let things of the world 
take over. That means determination. That means willpower. So we're to focus on what it is we're doing. And that distinguishes it from if I eat crackers and grape juice at home on Tuesday afternoon. Well, technically I'm doing the same thing, but it's not the Lord's Supper. When I do it with all of us here, what am I doing on the first day of the week? I'm observing and I'm remembering Christ's death. And then they have special significance. Outside the Lord's Supper, the grape juice and unleavened bread, they don't have any significance whatsoever. But on the table of the Lord, His table, by His authority, I'm doing it in remembrance of Him. And then it becomes the most special part of the week. But to whom? Disciples. Baptized believers. Followers of Christ. Those have that special blessing of being able to partake every first day of the week. And how important it is, how, how easy it is for us to forget those things. That's why we have to be reminded of them periodically. That's why I have to be reminded of things periodically. Because I can easily forget. And we never want it to become a ritual. It loses its power. Are you spiritually sick? Spiritually weak? People can become spiritually weak. One of the reasons might be because we're not focusing, we're not discerning the Lord's body. We're not discerning what we're doing. That can make us weak. Or maybe we've never even named the name of Christ, never even been baptized for the forgiveness of our sin. That may be what you need to do next. But as we sing this invitation song, let's think about am I in the body of Christ? Am I a part of that, that the saved, the church? Or if I am, maybe I'm spiritually weak because I have, I've been uh, not focusing on what I'm doing with the Lord's Supper because it can have drastic effects. If you need to respond in either one of those ways, we, we want to encourage you as we stand and sing this song to come forward.